What's up? What's up, IG? What is up? What is up? What is this? Thursday night check-in? Not Sunday night check-in? Not Monday? Not Tuesday? Not Wednesday? But Thursday? Hey, Jasmine. Hey, Queen. Hey, Anthony. Queen is in... I saw someone's name, Queen. Willis Royalty. Good evening, good evening. What's going on? Chunky Hills and Peppermint. Hey, Minister Sharon, how are you? How are you? Good evening, good evening. What's going on? Miss Kena Lene, I have not been on in a minute. I have been traveling. I have been out of the country again. Pastor Dobbins and I are back home and I got a semi-day arrest yesterday. Hey, Vanessa, Miss Sunshine, Kevin, Maisha. Um, we have been out of town. Sorry for these glare on these glasses, um, but I'm going to have to order new glasses. I left my glasses in an Uber in Paris. And so I've been trying to make these um, glasses work until I actually now have to go get another prescription and order me some new glasses because my prescription had expired. So sorry for the glare on the glasses tonight. Good evening. Good evening. Hope all is well. See you later, son. Make sure to lock that door. Um... Hope all has been well. I see a lot has happened uh, since I have last spoken with you all. I feel like I have um, been keeping up. Uh, I'll, while people are coming on, Pastor Dobbins and I went to London last Tuesday, and we returned this Tuesday. Uh, thank you. Our anniversary is actually on this coming Monday. So it was kind of like a pre-anniversary celebration. Hey, Maurice, um, we went to London. Hey, Maurice, uh, we went to London. Um, had a good time in London. Actually preached unexpectedly in London on Sunday. Um, I'll have to put that, that link somewhere in my bio. Um, and perhaps I may even talk about a little bit what I talked about. Hey, Queen, good evening. Uh, Queen Hadas. Um, and so, yeah, Pastor Dobbins and I will be married 20 years on this coming Monday. Yeah, you've been looking forward to this live. Listen, I almost went live several times in the UK. I saw so much that was going on. And I normally, 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 thank you, Micah. For, okay, let's, that's it. Let's start with closing the gap. Let's back up to before I left for the UK. On February 3rd, Closing the Gap was absolutely phenomenal. Hey, Minister Boy, thank you. Um, it always is. We always know the Holy Spirit does what the Holy Spirit does at Closing the Gap because we are available and free for God to do whatever he wants to do. Hey, Eric, but at this last Closing the Gap, Closing the Gap, Pastor Joshua Opara, we had closing the gap on a Friday night. Pastor Joshua Opara, Opara got up and did the, hey, Queen Manda, got up and took the offering. Because I generally defer to other people to take the offerings because I said, and I said before, you know, our people feel a way about offerings. And so, um, and that's why we have to, as ministers of the gospel, work really for God and from the pureness of our heart. Because sometimes your people uh, have their own hangups and don't always give. And so I'm not here to even talk about all that. So I let Pastor Joshua, as Pastor Joshua began to talk and the Holy Spirit began to move and on the offering and he began to pray for those that sold. And I got up and, and something shifted. And literally, I started laying hands and ministering to people during what was the offering. And I did at the end tie it up and give a word. I don't know, but now since we're talking about closing the gap, this is a good place to start. Like the spirit of the Lord, a uh, spirit of increase just broke out. Um, whether you were in lack, 
God was going to increase you. Whether you had a lot, God was going to increase you. The Holy Spirit, a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom, and the gift of prophecy began to just flow. Hey, Bianca. And um, just in a unique way. He always flows that close in the gap. But this time, God blew our minds, literally. It is not an embellishment. Um, the next close in the gap is going to be on a Friday night again. I believe March 3rd back at Faithville Church, and you want to be in the room. You don't want to miss it. But I want to say this. That night, for those of you that are in the room, hey, Aish, for those that are in the room, you can confirm what I'm saying. I I closed out service, which, which this actually happens at Closing the Gap more frequently. I closed out service online, but I continue to minister in person. And the spirit of the Lord had me to warn people that night about, um, first about um, vows that had been made. That some of you, there were vows and curses that were made in your bloodline. And I began to minister on February 3rd before uh, the internet went crazy uh, with Christians uh, talking about who should say something and who shouldn't say something and who should give this word and is this word too harsh. Before all of that, that night in that room, I warned the people of bloodline curses and I warned the people of their idols that are, that are singers, that their idols were coming down and that some of their idols that God has said particular people were idols and I began to give a warning and I, I uh, listen, first of all, so let me, since I'm saying this, let me say this. What I am saying now is not attached to any other entity other than Christy Dobbins Ministries. I am speaking as a spokesperson of Christy Dobbins Ministry and nobody else. So let me say that first. But that night I had them to turn that live off. This part is not public, Miss Keena Lene. I, 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 I had them to turn the live off. I warned, war, uh, I warned them that they needed to renounce and denounce some curses. I warned them that they re needed to renounce and denounce some of their favorite pop singers. I warned them all about this. Hey, Renee, on February 3rd. I did not fully remember what I said until someone in the room had recorded anyway and sent me the last 10 minute recording that I had uh, after we have been seeing everything that has been going on in social media and the internet about whether Christians should give warnings, whether Christians should say whatever. But the Lord gave me this warning on February 3rd to give to these group of people in a closed group. And for those that were in that room, this is God letting you know that he is real, that what he, what is that, that he, he is giving us, um, in a multitude of counselors, there is safety. He confirmed what, um, he confirmed what I said. He confirmed it publicly through another prophet. Uh, he confirmed it publicly. Hey, Ben, Ben was in the room. What I said when we turned off that live, when I went back and listened to it, when someone sent it to me, I was almost amazed myself. That what I said in that room on a Friday night, after we turned off streaming live, another prophet stands boldly and says it out loud. And so I came on to catch up with you all. I came up, hey, Brother Jose, to catch up, let you all know we had a good time in London, a good time in Paris, that we had a good time, that I had an opportunity to preach. I was not supposed to preach, wasn't scheduled to preach, but I actually preached this past Saturday, Sunday, actually, Pastor Dobbins and I, uh, tag team. But I, yeah, Ben is confirming it because he was in the room. But I'm telling you, my spirit has been stirred ever since the prophet spoke her words because God had given me those same words. And I was happy that I released those words, even though it wasn't streaming live. There was at least 50 or 60 people in that room to confirm and hear those words on February the 3rd. And I said that all to say. 
People of God, they've been saying this all of my life, but it is really true. We are living in the last days. We are living in the last days when a prophet can speak forth the word of the Lord and receive persecution even from other people who consider themselves to be Christians, when people rise up against a prophetic word, they are actually showing us that we are in the last days. I didn't know I was going to start fully like this, but when someone mentioned closing the gap, it made me go back to closing the gap. And so now Vanessa was in the room, Renee was in the room and heard the word that I released on February 3rd after we, I, I had them to stop filming, stop streaming live and release the word of the Lord to some of the people that were in the room. And then for a week later for a prophet to stand up, uh, not a prophet, let me be clear so that people won't think I'm being ambiguous for prophetess Tiffany Montgomery to stand up and release the word of the Lord as well. Um, I, I feel compelled. I don't normally get into uh, all of this, but I do feel compelled as a minister of the gospel myself and as a prophet of the Lord myself. And I don't always identify myself as a prophet. For those of you who know me, even though I prophesy, I don't always announce that. Sometimes I let you be introduced to that before I announce that. But I do feel compelled to, to be a defender of truth. I feel compelled to be a defender of truth. Hey, Tawanji, I am, I, I have been holding myself back because I was on vacation in the UK with my husband celebrating the pre, the pre anniversary. But because the Lord had given me the same word and I had released that word to the people in closing the gap after we stopped live streaming and we went on and had more ministry and we went on and deliverance took place in that room and all of that because the Lord had already used me to say it. I feel compelled to be a defender of truth. I feel compelled to say that you better be careful. Woe unto us when we come against and we are believers come against those that God has anointed to give his word. See, the world can ridicule and the world can persecute. But when believers of Jesus Christ persecute one another, the Bible says the Bible says it this way. A house divided against itself can not stand. So I have been holding myself back because I don't like to get into just trending topics for the sake of getting into trending to topics. But everybody in that room heard me deliver such a similar word that how dare I sit back and keep my mouth shut while other people are, are, are ridiculing and persecuting one person who had the boldness to open up their mouth wide and allow God to fill it. That's the scripture. Let me tell you where that is. I believe it's Psalm chapter 79. Open up your mouth wide. So I, 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 I came with my laptop, laptop, laptop tonight. Psalms 81, I'm sorry, and 10. Psalm 81 and 10. I am the Lord thy God who brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Open thy mouth wide and I will fill it. God spoke through a vessel who was willing to open their mouth wide and allow him to fill it. Now, let's talk about something right quick. I've seen all kind of here. I'm not here to say this person is right. This person is wrong. I came to defend the truth. And so the same word that was given to her was given to me. I just released it in a closed door setting on February 3rd. I am grateful that I have witnesses who are on this live that can confirm that I released sim a similar word. I'm not trying to get clout. I just want you to understand that the reason I have to be a defender of truth to shrink back and not defend the truth that God gave her would be to me, I didn't believe the truth that he revealed to me. So I don't need any credit for speaking it. I'm giving you the reason why I am more compelled to open up my mouth to be a defender of truth. I just want to give you scriptures though, because while I function, yes, in the prophetic, and I'm going to just leave it that way, in the prophetic, while I 
function in that. I am also a teacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I want you to understand some things that are happening. We have allowed this world to misrepresent what God looks like. Everyone tells us outside of the body of Christ, and I'm not, this is not my first time saying this. I'm going to repost a reel that I believe I posted back in the month of May when I said uh, I was at a conference in DeRitter, Louisiana, and I said, God's love has never been on trial. Why do we keep saying God is a God of love? That is without question. He is the God of love. But that is not the totality of who he is. That is not all he is. That's what I mean by that. He is not just love. God is also holy. He is not also holy. He is not a man that he should lie. So there is nothing that we can say or do that can contradict the word of God because when we contradict the word of God in the name of God, we are now saying that God is a liar. If I contradict the word of God and say God said it this way, then I am now accusing God of being a liar. The Bible says, whom he loveth, he chasteneth. The problem is we have misinterpreted what the Bible says of telling the truth in love. I, I, I say it this way, not just telling the truth in love. I'm telling you the truth because of love. Oh, somebody didn't catch that. I'm telling you the truth because of love. Because if I don't love you, I will leave you in darkness. I will leave you blind. I will leave you, leave you wondering. I will leave you going straight to hell. But love provokes me to be a bearer of truth so that you can be illuminated by the word of God. That's why David said it this way. That his word is an illumination. Thy, thy word is a lamp and a light. So wherever there is no word of God, there is darkness. That's why at the very beginning of creation, he says, let there be light. Without God, there is no light. Oh, you listen. Without God, there is no light. Let's go to the Bible. That's why the Bible says in the book of John, I'm going to the book of John chapter one. First John one and one says, before I even pull that up. Um, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. So there is no distinction between God and the word in the beginning was the word, the word was, was the with God and the word was God. The word was with God and the word was God. So you cannot separate God from his word. That's first, but I'm going to go to the King James version. Love is the greatest. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, meaning the word was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, by who is him, God. And without him, God was not anything made that was made in him was life and the life. Here comes the new word now was the light of men and the light shineth in darkness and the darkness comprehendeth it not. There is a language of light. Somebody needs to hear this. Light has a language. There is a language of the kingdom that darkness cannot comprehend. Therefore, darkness, if you are not a believer, if you are not led by the spirit of God, you can read the Bible as if it is a book, but you will not receive the illumination of the word without the spirit of God giving you the light. I'm going to just pause there for a moment. You need the spirit of God in order to give you the illumination of what light is saying. Darkness cannot comprehend light. Therefore, if someone is not a believer in Jesus Christ, I don't care how many times they read the Bible, they do not have the ability to teach and tell us what the Bible is saying because darkness cannot comprehend light. Then it goes on to say there was a man from God whose name was John. 
The same came for a witness to bear witness of now the word light is capitalized because that indicates light now is Jesus. There was a, the same came for a witness to bear witness of the light. Jesus is the light that all men through him, the light might be saved. He was not the light referring to John the Baptist, but he was sent to bear witness of the light. That's why he later says, behold, the spotless lamb of God, because he is bearing witness. He is identifying who the light is. Number eight, verse eight. He was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of the light. That was the true light, meaning Jesus was the true light. Hey, Denitra, which lighted every man that cometh into the world. He was not in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. So Jesus made the world but the world knew him not. Verse 11, he came into his own and his own received him not. We understand that he came to the Jews and they did not accept him. But as many as received him, hey, Aris, hey, Tanisha, as many as received him, to him he gave power to become the sons of God. So as many as received Jesus, he gave them the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but they were born of God. This is the next verse. And the word was made flesh. The word, what word? The in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. Now that word, the same word that verse two says that it was in the beginning with God, in, in, in Genesis chapter one, that was in the beginning with God. Now it is saying this word has become flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, this is, was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of the fullness have we all received and grace for grace. Now, I can't even go into all of that because I'll start teaching something else. This is my point. There has been much discussion. I have listened and I have watched online to person after person say that the prophet of God was in error. And they are basing it on very superficial are low understandings of what the Bible says. Oh, we, we're going somewhere. I get it. I don't deny that the Bible says, by this they'll know you are my disciples, that you have love one to another. That's, th that's not the problem. I, I've heard you all, I've heard all the complaints. She should have said it this way. She should have done it this way. She should have done this. And, 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 and people are saying it even people that believe what she said was true are emphasizing how she said it. And I get it. I get it. They tell us that communication is only 7% of the words that we say and all of these things that our natural man tells us. But this is a battle. This is a war. That was a war cry. That was a sounding of an alarm. And anybody in the middle of a battle is not running around whispering, is not running around telling you not to run in. They're not giving a warning in a low voice. So all of these little fleshly things that we're trying to measure something spiritual by, I just want to come as a defender of the truth to simply say this. I don't know if we've all read our Bibles. I don't know if we all have studied the word enough to know what the what the what the word of God what the word of God really says. I want to give you some, some scriptures. I'm going to read it to you in an amplified version because I want to break this down for you. I want you to understand this is what Jesus was saying. This is what Jesus was saying right here in, in Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 to 39. Since everybody tries to po point Jesus and paint Jesus as a lamb, which he was a lamb, but he was also the lion of the tribe of Judah. Since everybody tries to paint Jesus in a way that makes him seem, I'm, for lack of a better word, soft, let me explain to you what Jesus said. J Matthew chapter 10, somebody put this in the comments so people can go back and read this for themselves. Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 through 39. Do not think 
that I have come to bring peace on earth. This is Jesus talking. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. I'm reading this in the Amplify so to make you understand, but a sword of the division between belief and unbelief. Listen, believers and unbelievers should never be in agreement over the things of God because one does not even understand or comprehend light. One has no understanding because intellect can't understand it. Your abilities can't understand it. It is only through the spirit of God that we will understand and comprehend the word. Do not think that I have come to bring peace on earth. I have, I have not come to bring peace, but a sword of division between belief and unbelief. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law, her mother-in-law and a man's enemies will be the members of his own household when one believes and another does not. So if you, if, if I'm married to an unbeliever in the spirit, we're not in agreement. Listen, I'm going to read this again. He is, the word of God is a sort of division between unbelievers and believers. Unbelievers and believers, the word of God. Let me, let me, let, 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 let me, let me, let me, let me, let me back this up before I even keep reading this. Let me go to the book of Hebrews and somebody needs to, to give them Hebrews chapter four. I really need the full chapter, but I'm going to read Hebrews four and 12. The Bible says, and I'm reading the King James now for the word of God is quick, which means alive and powerful and sharper than a two edged sword. So the word of God, the Bible is sharper than a sword that had, that is a sword on both ends. See, most times if you have a sword, you're holding it on one end. It's something you can grip and you can hold on to. Oh, you better get this. See, when, 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 when your children grow up and the boys are playing and they're playing like with a sword, a play sword, there's something they can grip and only one end is pointed like it's the sword, which is an indicator only one end can cut. You can't hold the word of God like that because both ends of the word of God are sharp. That's why you need to, you only way to really hold the word of God is by believing in the word of God. No fleshly hand can put a grip on it and hold it because it is sharper than a two-edged sword. Piercing. Even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Listen, I'm going to read this to you in a different version. I'm going to read this to you in the Amplified because I need you to get it. I need you to understand today what the word of God is saying. Hey, prophet Elijah, for the word of God is living and active and full of power, making it operative, energizing, and effective. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating as far as the division of the soul and the spirit. So the word of God pierces between what is your soulish realm and what is your spiritual realm. It is dividing the soul and the spirit. When you got saved and accepted Jesus Christ as your savior, your soul is now being saved and your spirit man was saved immediately. The part of you that is being saved is your will, your mind, and your emotions. The part of you that was saved immediately is your spirit. Your mind and your will and emotions are being transformed or being changed by the word of God. So the word of God divides what is spiritual and what is fleshly. That's the soulish realm. The word of God divides, but we've already established that the darkness cannot even comprehend what the word of God is saying. And brother Elijah that came on here, he did a really, really, really good live that all of you all should go back and look at. Um, 
earlier this week. I'm, I'm coming from a different perspective, but I am talking about the same thing since I am really just settling back in from America. So I'm going back to Matthew chapter 10 because what I am addressing is all of the Christians. I'm not even addressing unbelievers because unbelievers comprehend not the word of God. I am addressing the Christians who I see that are commenting and making statements about Jesus that are either incomplete or not true at all. Back to Matthew chapter 10, where Jesus says, do not think that I have come to bring peace on earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword of division between belief and unbelief. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be the members of his own household when one believes and the other does not. What sets us at odds is when one believes and one does not, we are not in agreement because according to Amos chapter three, verse three, except to, uh, except we're in agreement, how can two walk together except they be agreed? So we're not in agreement. Hey, Kevin, because we have different belief systems. My belief system is established in, in the foundation of Jesus and the word of God. Their belief system is founded on whatever feels right, whatever culture says, what, whatever, whatever they're choosing this day. But my belief system is already sure. Whether I have read the entire Bible, I am saying I am a believer that this word is true. And I am now causing my fleshly belief systems to surrender to what the word says. Because I have allowed the spirit or the word to defy the spirit and the soul. Verse 37, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. So this is Jesus saying, if you love your mother or father more than you love me, you're not worthy of me. If you are willing to compromise the sins that they have because of the relationship with them, if the relationship with them causes you to, to compromise and to, to, to support them in the sin that they are doing, and we are seeing this growing over here in America in the body of Christ, that we are now changing how we feel about certain things. And I'm, I'm using that word on purpose because oftentimes we're using that word too much. I feel this. I feel that. What, what the word says about a situation, my feelings do not matter at all. My feelings are, it are subject to the word of God. I have to now exercise temperance, self-control over my feelings and surrender to the word of God. So Jesus is saying, if you love them more than you love me, you're not even worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross, which is expressing a willingness to endure whatever may come and follow me, believing in me, conforming it to my example and living it, if need be suffering or perhaps dying because of the faith of it, because of faith in me is not worthy of me. If you're not willing to give it up all for Jesus, he's saying you're not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life in this world will eventually lose it through death. And whoever loses his life in this world for my sake will find it. That is life with me for all eternity. I think Brother Elijah talked about this the other night. I, I'm really just reading you some scriptures because what I have learned is we are an illiterate body of Christ. That we have allowed ourselves to have a diet of the word that is so weak and so watered down and so full of, of, of candy and sweets that we do not know the meat of the word when it shows up. And so when someone comes forth ringing truth, because truth is oftentimes um, abrasive. Truth can be abrasive. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. See, what I've learned is we keep saying, oh, you need to say it nicely. No, your flesh doesn't even care how it's said. Let's just be honest. Your flesh is your flesh. Your flesh wants to be appeased. And anytime something is coming for something of your flesh, your fleshly man, if he's not surrendered and dead, if you have not killed him, is going to rise up against that which is saying this flesh needs to die. 
So I just want to go and read from Corinthians for a moment. Because the Corinthians church is much like the church we live in now. It's a very gifted church, a very anointed church, but also a very immoral church. I said it. It is a very gifted church, a very anointed church, and a very immoral church. Elder Dobbins, you're calling us immoral? I'm just saying as, as a body... We have weakened the standards. Yes, there are pockets of holiness. I get that. But as a body, we have weakened the standards. We have weakened what is acceptable. We have allowed culture to dictate to us rather than us being the light of the world and being salt in this world. We have succumbed to the pressures of the outside and we now want to look more like the world. And I said this at Closing the Gap on February 3rd when I was talking after we stopped recording and I began to minister and I said we are looking for affirmation of the world. Something about the church now wants to be affirmed. We want to say I have a celebrity member. We want to say I am the prophet to the celebrity. We want to say I am the prophet to this one. And we're saying that we are the prophet to this one, but yet when we look at this one, there is no tangible change. What is your discipleship? Uh, listen, what are your measurables? What are your measurables of your discipleship? What are your measurables of the time that you spend? It is not enough to keep saying and drop naming people's names if when they have spent time with you, we see no measurable or tangible change. If there is no measurable, if, if it was a business, you would have key performance indicators. There would have to be deliverables that if you gave somebody, somebody had a job and was working for you, there would be 90 day evaluation. You'd have a six month evaluation. We have an annual evaluation. I am now asking you to take a spiritual assessment of the evaluation of those that you are saying you are, you are discipling or you are leading. What is the 90 day? Are you just name dropping and saying that you are a prophet to this one or a pastor to this one and you're just putting your name with them because they can give you a big seed and they can drop a lot of money. What are the key performance indicators that are proving that you are actually discipling them and they are not recruiting you? Where is the fruit? Where, listen, listen, the days of celebrity culture in the church, hear me good, are over. God wants his throne back. Jesus is king of kings and Lord of lords. And what I'm seeing in the back and forth and the, uh, the attack, yes, we can apply that to every relationship. And the attack that I have seen from Christians on another Christian for the sake of the world is ungodly. A house divided against itself cannot stand. We have too much happening on our watch to turn around and attack one another. God wants his throne back because I said this before, the idols are coming down with or without us. God is bringing the idols down with or without us. And so really I'm only here giving scripture to show you that many people don't know that Jesus said he came for a sword and that Jesus is telling us that sometimes to choose him, it means you've got to even not be in agreement with people of your own household because you have got to choose him. You have got, there has got to be a reckless abandonment of him. 
but we're not teaching that gospel anymore. We're not teaching a gospel of holiness. If I hear one person type again or say again, the Bible says, come as you are. I haven't even seen that scripture. But what I do know is what you continue to do is stay where you are. If you have had an encounter with Jesus, at some point there should be fruit. At some point, the Holy Ghost in you should want to be in agreement and alignment with the Jesus in you and that there be agreement. The reason we don't have external agreement is because there's no two internal, there's no internal agreement. You are warring amongst yourselves internally. Therefore, that conflict is now spewing out and spilling out in the body. So Jesus says, as, as Elder Tawanji is typing to Nicodemus, ye must be born again. Once you are born again, you need to be discipled. Discipleship is, is, is a lost art in the body of Christ as a whole. But the Great Commission told us to disciple nations. And we're not even discipling those that are close to us. Elder Tawan, like, there are so many misrepresentations of Jesus. You know, they, they, Jesus hung with sinners. Listen, Jesus didn't hang with anybody that did not now become impacted by Jesus. Jesus wasn't going to a club, the same club every Saturday night, and no one at the club was ever getting saved. Let's give real life experiences. Jesus wasn't hanging out with people that he wasn't supposed to hang out with, and they never getting changed and transformed. We keep making excuses for our inabilities to live a disciplined and holy life. I have a lot of scriptures to read to you and I'm going to read this one. I think brother Elijah read this the other night. I was on the plane coming back and I was about to throw my phone because I've been saying this. Like I said, I didn't even respond to all of this because I was out of town, out of the country. Um, but this, I just, this is, I just know we don't know the word y'all. And if we knew the word, we wouldn't say some of the things we say because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. But I'm reading to you 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And I don't preach out of the Amplified, but tonight I am reading out of the Amplified because I know we have every level of believer on here and I want there to be an understanding of what the word is saying. But I want you to hear the Apostle Paul. This is New Testament. This is not the Old Testament. But before I even go to that, let me tell you something. For a lot of people that have a problem with what the prophet said and how the prophet said it, first of all, the prophet, she was speaking to Christians. She was speaking to believers. And Proverbs 27 and 5 says, open rebuke is better than secret love. Somebody just put in the comments. It's in the Bible. Proverbs 27 and 5, open rebuke is better than secret love. This is what God's love looks like. God's love is not like our love. His love is open rebuke is better than secret love. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the entire chapter. Somebody put that in the comments so people will know what they have to go back and read for themselves. I want you to go back and read this for yourself. Somebody put 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and it's in the Bible because I'm getting ready to read it to you. What the Apostle Paul read. But the Apostle Paul wrote to the church of Corinth. Now I'm back to where I was saying a few minutes ago. A church that is much like us, highly gifted, uh, highly gifted, highly anointed, Yet, they had many problems. Verse 1, it is actually reported everywhere that there is sexual immorality among you. He's talking to the church. Let's be clear. He's talking to the church. A kind of immorality that is condemned even among the unbelieving Gentiles. So the kind of immorality that even unbelievers think is immoral. 
that someone has an intimate relationship with his father's wife, with their stepmother, and you are proud and arrogant, you should have mourned in shame so that the man who has done this disgraceful thing would be removed from your fellowship. Wait a minute, Paul, what are you saying? The man who has done this disgraceful things needs to be removed from your fellowship. For I, though absent from you in the body, but present in spirit. So he's saying, I, but I'm not there with you, but I am in spirit. Have already, I want y'all to hear this word, passed judgment on him who has committed this act as if I were present. Somebody say that's in the Bible. It is appropriate that believers judge the actions of other believers. Somebody put that it's in the Bible. Stop running around quoting Tupac, only God can judge me. Stop running around quoting other lyrics that are not the Bible. Paul says, I'm not even there, but I've already passed judgment on the person that committed this act. And in the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are assembled, when you come back together and I am with you in spirit, meaning I'm still not going to be there, but this, I am there in spirit with the power of the Lord Jesus, you are to hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of his body so that his spirit may be saved in the day of our Lord Jesus. This is in the Bible. This is what the church does with the church. So when the prophet was talking to the church, stop misquoting her. She was not talking to the world. She was talking to the church. This first Corinthians chapter five is in the Bible. You're boasting over the supposed spirituality of your church is not good. Indeed, it is vulgar and inappropriate. Do you not know that just a little leaven ferments the whole batch of dough, just as a little sin corrupts a person or an entire church? So remember in the Old Testament, when they had unleavened bread or uh, bread without yeast, but they would say a little leaven, just a little drop of yeast would leaven the whole lump. That's what a little drop of sin does. Just a little drop of sin will contaminate the whole body. It says it corrupts a person or an entire church. This is the Bible. I'm not even exegeting. I don't even have to exegete this. I'm just really giving you the word of God so that you will understand as believers what is appropriate for the body of Christ. I'm not talking to unbelievers because we've already established that the darkness comprehended it not. Unbelievers have no comprehension of this. So I can't, I'm not here to argue back and forth with unbelievers. What I'm here to off do with unbelievers is offer them Jesus. Just a little sin corrupts a person or an entire church. Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new batch just as you are still unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast. That's the Passover. Not with old leaven, nor with leaven of vice and malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread. Oh, now he's telling us what the unleavened bread is spiritually of sincerity and untainted truth. I started off saying I'm a defender of truth. Verse nine, I wrote you in my previous letter not to, this is Paul. I just got to keep saying this for the talking to people in the New Testament church. So this is New Testament for those that like to say that's the Old Testament that the God that was okay. The New Testament. This is Paul after grace and mercy. I wrote you in my previous letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not meaning the immoral people of the world. So I'm not talking about the immoral unbelievers or the greedy ones and swindlers or idolaters of the world. For then you would have to get out of the world and human society altogether. So he's not meaning that you can't be in the world with them because to be away from all sin, you would have to be out of the world. But actually, I have written to you not to associate with any so-called Christian brother if he is sexually immoral or greedy or is an idolater, one who is devoted 
to anything that takes the place of God. Y'all, for those of y'all that have been coming to close in the gap, I have been telling you that worship is a posture of your heart and that anytime you put anything in the place of your heart that is reserved only for God, it is idolatry. Let me help you. I'm not even just talking about the, the music of the world and all of these things that people are struggling to let go and struggling to release and struggling to, to accept that this is not beneficial in the kingdom. I'm going to give you a dream that my mother shared with me. And some of you have heard me say this and some of you haven't. My mother, for those of you who don't know, passed away in ninth. Oh, I'm not going to tell. I don't want to tell my age tonight. Passed away two days before my 18th birthday in a car accident. And about a month before she passed, she shared a dream she shared a dream with me. And she said she had a dream and that the Lord told her, have not woke her up and said have no other god before me. And she says, "Lord, I don't I don't have any other God before you. I've served you since I was 12." She's running down her spiritual resume. As if God doesn't know her spiritual resume. She goes back to sleep and she wakes them up. He wakes her up again and says, have no other God before me. She said, I don't have any other God before you. Everything you ask me to do, I do. You tell me to preach. You tell me to teach. I pass off food to the, to the widows. All of these things that she names and goes back to bed. Much like Samuel he calls her the third time. And I need you to hear me real good because I want to read that to you again. An idolater is anything, it's the, any, uh, someone who has anything devoted when, you, when you're devoted to anything that takes the place of God. The way I normally word it is when you put any play thing in the place that is reserved only for God. Hey, Deja, thank you for the badge. Thank you to Wanji for the badge. Brother Jose, those of you who have given badges, thank you for the badges. But God says to her the third time he woke her up and she said, I have no other God before you. He said, but in your heart, it's your children. And I didn't understand why she shared that story with me until the last five or six years or so, as I began to teach more on worship and God began to reveal to me and have me to say things that worship is not a slow song, that people are, are, are believing that they're in positions of worship, but their hearts are far from me. And God says to her, your children in your heart, it's your children, even though outwardly you're obeying me, but in your heart, your children are in a place that's reserved only for me. And I know that sounds really hard, but you have to understand that before I was born, my mother, I am my mother's oldest child, my mother and my father's oldest child. There are three of us. It was me, my mother, me, my, my sister and my baby brother, who was also killed in the car accident with my mother. But before me, my mother had three miscarriages. One of the, the, the um, three pregnancies, two were miscarriages. One of the pregnancies, she gave birth. They were triplets. Two of them lived a couple of hours and the third one was born dead. So let's use modern day term. She had experienced trauma after trauma after trauma in trying to conceive and bring forth children. When she got ready and got pregnant with me, they were already in line to adopt somebody. So much so that to this day, I know the person that they were going to adopt. We know the story and he still calls us brother and call, I, call, I call him sister, him my brother and he calls me him sister because they were going to finally adopt and she got pregnant again. And this time, the Lord allowed her to carry her baby full term. Thank you for the badge. And because sometimes you have, oh Lord, I have, Jesus, you have fixated and you have had to fight for something for so long. And when God finally releases it to you, you don't even realize that you've positioned it somewhere that was reserved only for God. 
See, God is a good, good father. God knew my mother was going to die in her accident about a month later. And even though outwardly and everybody testifies to the lifestyle my mother lived, God judges our heart. And I believe that was his last way of revealing to her. Everything else is all right, but I, I got to get this last thing out of your heart so that when your day comes just shortly, you've surrendered those children to me. The children that he knew, two of us, she would leave behind and she wouldn't even get to see our end. She wouldn't even get to finish raising us that every hope and dream she ever had for us. She would never witness with her own eyes. Those hopes and dreams that she had right here in the heart, everything that she desired and wanted. And it's good to have godly desires. But God said in your heart, it's your children. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're not lost. We still talking to the church tonight. If you are an unbeliever and you're not saved, we want to offer you Jesus. But this lie, this teaching is for the body of Christ. Because these last few days, I've seen so much written and typed on social media that it grieved my heart that we have a body who does not really know their God because the way to know your God is to know his word. You want to experience the power of God, but you don't want to sit and get to know the ways of God and the mind of God by studying his word. See, the old folks said God works in mysterious ways, but actually, if you sit yourself down and study this word and allow the Holy Spirit to reveal God to you through the word, you will know the thoughts of God. You will know the ways of God and you will accept that they are superior to yours and that they are holy and your thoughts are unholy. You will accept that he is God and you will stop trying to rewrite the book as you go along and try to re and change the manual and change the guide to accommodate you and those of your household. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus. Jesus. Verse 11 says, I mean, First Corinthians chapter five, verse 11. But actually I've written to you not to associate with any so-called Christian brother. If he is sexually immoral or greedy or is an idolater devoted to anything that takes the place of God or is a reviler who insults or slanders or otherwise ver ver uh, verbally abuses others or is a drunkard or a swindler. This is what Paul says. You must not so much as even eat with that person. When you look historically, when they would break bread together, together, it was sign of covenant. He said, you don't even sit down and break bread with them. For what business is it of mine to judge outsiders, non-believers? What business? I'm not judging the world. Do you not know? Do you, do you not judge those who are within church? This is where you judge to protect the church. As the situation requires. Judgment is required in the church to protect the church. The, the problem is you don't realize the church, the body has many members. And it is our responsibility through judging according to scripture, not according to flesh, not according to your desires. To protect the church. God alone sits in judgment on those who are outside the faith, the unbelievers. But this is not what he says to the church. Remove the wicked one from among you. Expel him from your church. Somebody type, it's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. So when we let the world Give us this blanket statement of God is love. Yes, God is love. But God loves the church and wants to protect the church. And God's love includes correction. God's love includes instruction. God's love includes direction. God's love is not like this little phileo love that we have down here on earth. 
God's love are, are part of his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. So here, when we're in the church and we're called into accountability and we say, oh, you can't judge me. That's a lie. If you're in the body of Christ, that's a lie. And if you don't want to change, according to scripture, Paul, the chief apostle of the New Testament says, remove them from your church. Remove them from among you in order to protect the whole group because a little leaven Leaven the whole lump, the whole, the whole. So you're going to let a little sin come in and corrupt the whole body. Hallelujah. It's in the body, the Bible. I don't know where we're going to land right now, but. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me tell you something. Thank you, Lord. Genesis 8 and 22 says, um, as long as the earth remains, there will be seed time and harvest. Cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, and it shall not cease. I want you to hear that. As long as the earth remains, I'm going somewhere, there is going to be seed time and harvest. So you plant it, and then you reap the harvest. Cold, then hot. Summer, then winter. Day and and night. I want to read you and I'm going to read quite a bit of them just so we can get the pattern here that we now have established. Because if you look at that pattern, as long as the earth remains, there's seed time and harvest, hot and cold, summer and hot. So when you look at that pattern, it is either hot or cold. It, it, it didn't talk about fall or spring. Those are lukewarm seasons. Those are seasons where in the fall, you might get a day that's cool and you might get a day that's hot. You might start off cool. You might end up hot. In the spring, it starts off cool and ends up hot. Those are lukewarm seasons. But he says in Genesis 8 and 22, he sets a pattern. It's a principle of first mention. When you study and use the principle of first mention, it is establishing a precedent or a pattern throughout which you can now study scripture. So as long as the earth remains, that is seed time, there is harvest. It is hot. It is cold. It is winter. It is summer. Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 8 then comes back and underscores this. It says to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. And it begins to do follow the pattern of hot and cold or seed time and harvest or winter uh, and summer. It says a time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up. A time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. I want you to see the pattern. Hot, cold, summer, winter, seed time, harvest, born, die, plant, pluck, break down, build up, mourn, dance, cast away, gather, embrace or refrain. There are the two opposites. It is establishing the patterns. These are, these are two extremes. These are two polarities. These are not in the middle. These are not 
lukewarm. These are not lukewarm. Going to the book of Revelation, chapter 3. And the Bible says, he starts off, um, I don't want to name that one. It's talking to the seven churches of Asia. And he goes down to verse 13 and he says, unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, write, these things set the amen, that's a capital A, so that's referring to God, the, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Verse 15 says, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou were cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou said, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. I'm going to read that to you in a different translation because I want to make sure that you understood what I'm still talking about, how God operates, how God operates with the body of Christ. We're in Revelation chapter 3, reading from verse 4. 14. Now I'm back in the Amplified so that we can get full understanding because we have all level uh, of believers or readers of the word on here. It says to the angel, the divine messenger of the church in Laodicea, write, these are the words of the Amen, uh, the trusted and faithful and true witness, the beginning and origin of God's creation. I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm, I want y'all to hear what this says, spiritually useless and neither hot nor cold. I will vomit you out of my mouth, rejecting you with disgust because you say I am rich and have prospered and grown wealthy and have need of nothing. And you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked without hope and in great need. I counsel you to buy from me gold that has been heated, red hot, and refined by fire so that you may become truly rich and white clothes representing righteousness and healing salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. To whom I dearly and tenderly love, I rebuke and discipline, showing them their faults and instructing them. So be enthusiastic and repent. Change your inner self, your old way of thinking, your sinful behavior. Seek God's will. I'm going to end with this last scripture, I believe. 1 Peter 4 and 17. Again, I'm going to say this, and I probably said it 50 times tonight. I'm talking to the body of Christ. I am not talking to unbelievers. Hey, Alexandra, I am not talking. You're going to have to go back. That was the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verses 14, I believe, through 19. I read it first in the King James, and then I read it in the Amplified. First Peter 4 and 17, I'm going to read it first in the King James, and then I'm going to read it in another translation. says, for the time is come. That judgment must begin at the house of God. And if from us first, what will be the outcome of those disobeying the gospel of God? I'm going to read it in the King James. I mean, the Amplified. For it is the time destined for judgment to begin with the household of God. 
And if it begins with us, what will become the outcome for those who do not respect or believe or obey the gospel of God? I'm, let me read you all of this, 1 Peter 14. Let me start with 1 Peter 4, 4 and 16. It says, but if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but glorify God that you bear that name. For it is time for judgment to begin with the family of God. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who disobey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? That was a warning to the believers. Again, I don't normally jump into trending topics, but I just saw so many believers making comment about whether or not they believe the prophetess was right or she should have said it this way, she should have said it this way, or this is this is not love and da 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 da. And I just needed to take time to read you scriptures because I, I could tell that many people haven't read their Bibles and many people haven't been taught and they don't really know. And I want to give you, if you just got on, I want you to read these scriptures yourself. I read them. Uh, some of them in the King James and Amplified. Some of them I read in the Amplified only so that people will have a true understanding what the Bible was saying. But I want you, and if y'all can just start putting these in the comments as we prepare to wrap up. I first read Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 through 39. Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 through 39. I read the entire chapter of 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I read to you the book of Proverbs chapter 27 verse 5 that says open rebuke is better than secret love. Open rebuke is better than secret love. That is Proverbs 27 and 5. I then read Revelation chapter 3 verses 14, I believe through 19. I think I closed that tab out. I'll go back. But Matthew chapter 10, 30, 34 through 39, the entire first Corinthians chapter five, Proverbs 27 and five. Thank you, Derry. Thanks. Thank you, Miss Kina, Lene, brother Jose. Oh, I also read you Hebrews four and 12. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We started off reading John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14, establishing, I believe it was around verse 5, that darkness cannot even comprehend light. Therefore, you should not debate back and forth with somebody who is in darkness because they do not have the ability to comprehend the things of God. So we read a lot of scripture tonight so that we would have be better equipped as believers I'll, I'll say them all again for you, uh, rooted in just one second. So that we can be better as, e there it is. Thank you, Micah. Micah got them all. Micah counsel got them all. Matthew 10, 34 through 39, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Proverbs 27, verse 5, Revelation chapter... Chapter 3, verses 14 through 19, John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14, and Hebrews 4 and 12. What I really want you to know, those of you who just joined, is 1 Corinthians chapter 5. When you read that, Paul is talking to the church at Corinth. This is the New Testament, and he gives a guideline of what to do with the immoral believers. And he begins to say, we can judge believers, but God judges the world. So, so don't stop saying that when someone tries to correct you in the church, don't judge you. No, it's called accountability. And he even goes, goes on to say, hey, this person don't want to change. Put them out the church. I, I'm not trying to put you out the church tonight. I'm trying to give you understanding of what the word says because I'm looking at what people have been saying this last week because uh, because of really not wanting to give up an idol. And so we use everything else then to just say, Lord, 
Help me. Lord, I don't want to give this up. I need your grace, which is sufficient to help me release this. So we say all these other things as smoke screens to prevent us from being accountable for our actions. And, and I, don't, I don't really care if you ever preach. I don't care if you ever prophesy. I don't care if you become an apostle, a prophet, a pastor, a teacher, or evangelist. I care that you become a disciple. Because the problem is we already have too many apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists, and teachers who are not even disciples themselves. We have those in leadership who are not even disciplined in following after Christ. They're like that church in Laodicea that I just read about in Revelation where they say, I'm rich. And now we're using money as, as almost the symbol that, we, that we're walking with God. And don't get me wrong. I believe, I believe the earth is the Lord, the fullness thereof. I know that the cattle on a thousand hills belong to us. I know that the blessing of the Lord maketh rich and addeth no sorrow. And I know according to your faith, whatever it is, according to your faith, God has the ability. He has given you the ability and power according to Deuteronomy 8 and 18 to get wealth. So I'm not against you having wealth, but wealth is not a sign that you are walking with God. It is time to be disciplined. There is coming a time very soon, very soon. There's an old song that they used to sing in my church that's been in my spirit all week. Payday, payday, payday is coming after a while. I didn't even understand that song as a child. But there is coming a time that we all going to have to give an account. Payday, payday, payday is coming after a while. That's a time that whatever you sowed that you're going to reap. That's your payday. Payday is coming after a while. That's why the book of Galatians, he says, who has bewitched you? Who has bewitched you? You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? God is not mocked. That which you sow it, that you're going to reap. So if you are sowing to the flesh, you're going to reap to the flesh. Hallelujah. 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 This is what has helped us. Is first Peter, second Peter three and nine. The Lord is not slack. Concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering. That's what's been helping us to us work, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's all this this call. When I said the prophet sounded an alarm, it was really just a call to repentance. Let me read it to you in the Amplified. The Lord does not delay as though he was unable to act and is not slow about his promise as some count slowness, slowness, but is extraordinarily patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. God bless you, Rooted. God bless you. 
Conviction is a sign that you are his. That's the first thing to be happy about. That, that conviction that we feel is the sign that he loves us. Whom he loves, he chastens. I think I did give that uh, scripture earlier. That is Hebrews 12 and 6. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endureth chasteneth, God dealeth with you as son. So when you are a son, you will accept the chastening. For what son... For what son is he whom the father chaseth not? Are you really a son if the father doesn't chasteneth you? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. So if the Lord doesn't correct you or chasten you, you are a bastard. You aren't even his. That's Hebrews 12, 6 through, not through 8. You can go on and read a little, really read 6 through 11. I'm not going to read all of it. Well, yeah, you know what? We've been on here long anyway. Let me read all of it and I'm going to read it in the Amplified so you'll really have an understanding that the enemy wants us to say things like, I don't want to be judged. And he wants us to have that defense up because he wants us to act as if we are bastards, that we do not belong to God. Verse Hebrews chapter 12, verse six, I'm reading it amplified now for the Lord disciplines and corrects those whom he loves and he punishes every son whom he receives and welcomes to his heart. You must submit to correction for the purpose of discipline. God is dealing with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? Now, if you are exempt from correction and without discipline in which all of God's children share, then you are illegitimate. Children are not sons at all. Moreover, we, ha we have earthly fathers who discipline us and we submitted and respected them for training us. Shall we not much more be willingly submit to the father of spirits and live by learning from his discipline for our earthly fathers disciplined us only for a short time as seemed best to them but he disciplines us for our good so that we may share in his holiness for the time being no discipline brings joy but seems sad and painful yet to those who have been trained by it Afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Now he's talking about these disciplines, right standing with God and a lifestyle and attitude that seeks, y'all, this is real good, conformity to God's will and purpose. If you discipline yourself and allow God to discipline you, It's going to yield peaceable fruit of righteousness, which is right standing with God and a lifestyle and attitude that seeks conformity to God's will and purpose. Not one that seeks to be in conflict with everything. You're trying to be in conflict with the word. You actually want to be in conformity with the word of God. That's Hebrews 12, 6 through 11, amplified. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, God, for your long suffering to us, work. We repent for every idol. Everything that is seated in the place in our heart that is reserved only for you, we cast it down at your feet. We repent for idols and altars that were built in our bloodline. We renounce them, every evil vow that was made, whether it was in allegiance to an organization that was ungodly, to a fraternity or sorority, whatever it is, whatever vow that was made, God, that is still present in our lineage, we renounce them tonight and we repent for every idol. We drop them now and we seek to have a lifestyle that seeks conformity to your will. 
Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your long suffering. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your word. Hallelujah. Thank you for your word. Psalm 119 and 130 says, The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. We thank you for the entrance of your word that has illuminated and shed light on idols that we need to get rid of. Me too, Miss Kena Lene. I repent. It was Psalm 119 and 130. Yeah. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord, for giving us the word that has now given us understanding. Hallelujah. 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 Some of you are going to rest well tonight. The things you've been wrestling with, I feel like you were struggling to release. The weight is dropping off right now. The weights are falling. The idols are falling because the interest of his word has given you light. Thank you, Lord. God bless you. God bless you, Adolphus. Thank you. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. God bless you, Diana. Amen. Hope to meet you too. God bless you. Yes, Rooted, I will upload this to my YouTube channel immediately. Uh, for some reason, the last lives I, used, I started saving YouTube starts saying they have music in the background and we don't we don't need ever have music so I just now upload them. Yeah, there's a piece. Yeah, there's a piece. I will upload this to my YouTube um immediately when we get off. I will save it and upload it uh and it will be there so that you can go back and study the word of God for yourself. That is how you really get a grasp of the word. It's not enough just to hear a word taught or a word preached. Uh, even if you receive a prophetic word, you should go back and find that word, a word in the Bible that could support that word. And so um, I, I will save it. But the way is to listen again, because faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. If you listen again, um, um, if you listen again, you will, it will become an engrafted word. 
Go ahead and let the tears fall, Miss Kena Lene. I, I, I feel the weight of his glory too. Uh, I am going to go ahead and wrap this up. We've been on, um, yeah, study and meditate on it. L listen, y'all, the, the, the devil is a deceiver. He uses half truths. And that's why I said some people are, you're welcome. God bless you, Rooted. Um, they give a picture of Jesus that's an incomplete picture. When they say that God is love because he is love, there will be no love in this world without him. But it is not the totality of who he is. That is not all he is. That's what I mean. That is not all he is. He is God. He is sovereign. He is holy. He is. And so um, I just felt compelled again um, to speak to the body of Christ and give us a word that is in the Bible to help us navigate because there, this, this, these times that we're living in, we're going to see more and more the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of, 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 of heaven is going to be in opposition even more. And you want to be sure to be on the Lord's side. And if you don't know what the Lord's side looks like, look to the word. Look to the word. I want us, you know, people to be careful. Wow. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God, Bianca. I, I do want to go back to just read one scripture to be careful that no matter what you do, not to say things quick out of flesh. Because Psalms 105 and 15 tells us, touch not mine anointed and do my prophets no harm. The prophet spoke what the Lord gave her to speak. We expect the world not to be happy because the enemy of our soul is not happy. But we cannot, as believers in the same body, attack, especially erroneously. I just kept looking at so many things and saying, Lord, they don't know what the word, their, their response is what they're saying. They're not in the word. And so my prayer for you is that you will begin to desire his word more than your necessary food. Hallelujah. I also want to, I may jump back on quickly tomorrow. I, I don't have time now, but I want to remind you, those of you in the Dallas Fort Worth area, I mean, if you want to fly in, it applies to you too. But on the 25th, we are having an all day session uh, on um, a prophetic intensive is what I'm calling it. We're going to be talking about prophecy, the gift of prophecy, word of prophecy, word of knowledge. We're going to do an intensive, a deep dive into dreams and dream interpretations. Pastor Dobbins will be teaching with me. So this is not just for women. This is for women and men only. Um, we are equipping the body. This is an, this is uh, something that I plan on having multiple times this year. I am going to tell you this is the cheapest it will ever be for $149 because we will be teaching you from about... Um, um, for about six or seven hours, teaching and imparting and, and all of that. And so uh, $149 is not even, it's not a lot of money at all, but it's what I'm calling an introductory price. Um, the, the next time that this intensive is offered, it will be at a different rate. And I am thank and brother Jose is coming in from New Jersey. I am believing God to even take us deeper in the word and in understanding and 
um, we are such a generation of dreamers. And so even, even as we go through this, this, uh, the, the, the session on dreams, and that is one of Pastor Dobbins' giftings, is dreams and anointings. Um, even as we go through teaching, we're going to teach on it first and we're going to trace and see how God spoke consistently through dreams. And he is still speaking consistently through dreams. And so that is an area that many people, um, often have questions about. And so again, it is next Saturday at 9.30 a.m. Lunch is going to be provided. Uh, I think I probably should have said it, but I didn't. So I may have to send out an email. If anyone has any dietary restrictions, let us know. Uh, meaning that you are, um, if you are allergic to something, um, let us know. You can let us know that at admin at christydobbins.com, A-D-M-I-N at christydobbins.com. Jasmine, can you put the link if they want to register? The link is in my bio though. It is in my bio, but if Jasmine, if you could, can you copy and put the link in the comments, um, for the intensive? It is again next Saturday, February 25th. And then we have Closing the Gap on March 3rd. It seems like that once a month is coming quickly. Um, but I am... Um, praise the Lord. Um, I am excited. I'm excited about what God is doing and what God is going to do um, on the 25th and on March 3rd, and we are eternally grateful for what God did tonight. I thank you again for everyone who brought a badge, who are sewing into just what the Holy Spirit wants to do here on this live. I think I even received the Zell. Thank you to the person that sent a Zell. God bless you um, while I was on. Um, I think that's all I have. Again, I'm back in the United States. We did have an awesome time. Um, I spoke on Sunday and maybe tomorrow night I'll get on and talk a little bit about what I spoke on Sunday um, because I think that is the beginning of that that message. Um, I just got I just barely touched it um, on Sunday. And so I want to share some of that with you and uh, talk a little bit more about the prophetic intensive. And um, so I'll jump back on for a little bit tomorrow. Um Okay, the link is in my bio. The link is in my bio if y'all want to register. Hey, Denitra, thank you. God bless you. Hey, Brother Marshall, you have missed it. We are getting off, but this will be put on my YouTube in a few minutes. And again, if you have not subscribed to my YouTube channel, I am trying to get to a 1,000 subscribers. Okay, Maisha, we see you March 3rd. Um... I'm trying to get it to a thousand subscribers. So if you have not subscribed to the YouTube channel, it costs you absolutely nothing. Just go over, please, and uh, subscribe. And um, again, this live is going to be put on there tonight. I am signing off now. Love you all very much. Thank you all. Um, the presence of the Lord was really here tonight. So we are for forever grateful to him. And I love you all. Look forward to, hey, sissy, that's my sissy, Toysla. Um, Look forward to jumping on a little bit tomorrow night. Hope you all are well. I will post it in a few minutes, Marshall, as soon as I get off. Love you, Miss New You. Love you, love you, love you, Alexandra. Love you, love you. Love y'all. Thank y'all so much. Love you, Bianca. Thank you again for the badges. Love you all so much. Good night. God bless y'all.